afternoon. Good afternoon. And this is such a pleasure to be here today on the Horace's platform. And uh, thank you to uh, everyone for joining in. And uh, my uh, warmest uh, regards to Aruna Ma'am, uh, Sabina, and also to uh, Nirupma who's joining us in some time. So this session was really important primarily because I was just part of a couple of other sessions where we were talking about uh, India as the land of startups and also how SMEs are very important to um, uh, India's future. Uh, now that we are talking about, you know, um, uh, all the predictions that we've made uh, about uh, e-commerce that it would overtake, uh, overtake uh, brick and mortar companies over, this, uh, over a period of time. Nobody could have predicted the changes that we saw in the last couple of years, I would say. The pandemic caused such a shift in consumer behavior that we did see drastic changes in record times. In fact, at the height of the pandemic, 10 years of e-commerce growth just happened in 90 days. While the pandemic has forced people to stay indoors, it also prompted a strong shift towards online buying. And the trend seems to be not just limited to India. Um, we, we've seen that COVID has led to an annual growth rate of over 76% for e-commerce sales in the US from uh, uh, 20, 2019 to June 2020. And similarly in Germany and Western Europe, uh, e-commerce sales surged by 16.2 and 17% respectively. So, you know, on one hand, we have the shoppers who were rarely shopping online, um, heading straight for their computers and credit cards to buy goods that were rarely purchased online because they were normally sold out in every online retailer. And uh, from there, we've seen quarantine, store closures, um, simple fear of entering outside, which has resulted in a major shift in consumer behavior. And that is how most SMEs and companies now are forced to reassess how they conduct business. With, with that, uh, you know, we also know that people uh, uh, who were looking at brands, uh, uh, large brands who were paying a lot of close attention to online behavior. Now, what you found is that, you know, suddenly you have a host of behavioral patterns and uh, customer wants in terms of what they want and what they are expecting all of us to offer. With this, you know, uh, SMEs are resuming business in India and rest of the world also. And we are also talking about the fact that they must adapt um, and adjust as far as new business strategies are concerned to address the new consumer who is primarily now used to shop, uh, you know, uh, shopping from the safe confines of his house with multiple benefits of try and buy. Uh, you know, you can get replacement within 15 days and a host of other benefits. So my uh, first question would go to Dr. Aruna Sharma. She's headed uh, two very important departments in the government of India, uh, which is both the Ministry of INB uh, and then the Ministry of Steel um, as a former secretary. So uh, ma'am, as we all know, uh, manufacturing is going to be one of the biggest contributors to the India growth story. And we've been talking about labor intensive manu manufacturing, especially looking at the fact that we have a demographic dividend. And if effectively facilitated um, uh, in some way or the other, all of this could be a, uh, I, mean, I would say, a game changer to accelerate economic growth, employment, uh, income levels, and also, uh, in, in a way, enhance supply chain efficiencies. According to you, what do you feel are the opportunities that you see in e-commerce for MSMEs to become part of the national and global supply chains? Uh, very, very pertinent question you have asked at this moment of time. Because if you look at the growth in SME or the percentage of SME which are on the e-commerce platform, that is to an extent of nearly 40% today. And that uh, they are aiming at reaching 76%. And like you rightly said, during COVID, they tasted the blood. They understood the advantage and their hesitancy of entering into this platform has they have overcome very well. Now, India needs literally 8 million jobs you have to create per annum if you have to maintain the present level of employment. And I'm very sure that you want a better level of employment and which is sustainable and better paying. We just don't want them to be 
the wage employers uh, like uh, you want them to graduate to the higher level and that is where the msme fits in very well because if i look at the core sectors which i have i've been dealing all along core sectors will be providing now more automation less job opportunities so this is a trend which is going to happen msmes will also automate but because of sheer numbers the employment opportunities are going to enhance there like anything and therefore it is very important for msme to expand their market so more the expansion of market more the job creation more the production and more the logistic arrangements that they will be needing and like you rightly said e-commerce has given them a wider market a better market uh, not just domestically which is uh, a huge consumer uh, zone that is available within india but also outside the country where they can really move ahead and uh, take advantage of it so even if a new entrant is there for that per, uh, manufacturer it is very easy to test his product in market by e-commerce platform which in normal traditional way is going to be very difficult so to create an employment to add to the growth story msme is going to be a center stage and for msme to expand to go the marketing platform will have to shift to the e-commerce which they are already doing in a very big extent but that needs to be facilitated and handheld at every steps you know that is going to make the whole difference in fact the sabina here she's got experience from almost all over the world and sabina you know you have the msme sector worldwide which finds finds a natural alley in the e-commerce sector when it comes to uh, uh, enabling a seamless hassle free experience for small businesses and there therefore it offers a very big opportunity now how important is it for a progressive country to build a conducive policy environment to benefit e-commerce penetration apart from you know just enabling msmes to gain market access on leverage technology because finally we need the msmes to grow into larger companies or smaller companies and from there on to medium companies so they, so that they have a certain amount of sustainable competitiveness even when they are warding off competition from around the world as well as you know fight, fighting locally with each other Yes, well, thank you so much, Vinod, for that excellent question and for having me here on on this panel today. Um, you know, it's a, it's a privilege to be here speaking with my fellow panelists. Um, you ask a very important question, and I think that being a, a a labor market expert, a jobs expert, my approach is always looking at these issues through a jobs lens. So let me just take a second and contextualize a little bit of this conversation in terms of the overall SMEs landscape in India in relation to the rest of the world as as you pointed out. So we've we've all heard the assertion that you know MSMEs are extremely important to the economy particularly for their role of job creation. We've all heard people say uh SMEs are the backbone of jobs in our country. and the 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 issue is that in india the small business ecosystem was fraught with challenges uh for quite some time now and 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 this was also a pre covid phenomenon so firms especially small firms struggled with uh access to electricity access to capital access to markets and there's a complex system of of non labor compliances and again i i want to emphasize i'm talking about non labor compliances that that have constrained small businesses and so what does this all amount to uh you know even before the pandemic just under 70% of india's firms were unregistered and 99% of them are unorganized meaning that they're less than 20 uh employees now of course what you know to to your point if we're talking about msmes as being competitive msmes as being uh you know the the backbone for jobs in our country the critical question here is how do you grow these industries how do you remove the challenges that they face how do you of which capital and markets are are part and parcel and we know that the pandemic is just making all of these challenges even worse for small businesses right so So at the end of the day we need to systematically consider how to aid our small businesses 
by enabling access to capital, simplifying non-labor compliance frameworks, building the appropriate infrastructure, including things like electricity, and enabling to access to markets. And this is where e-commerce becomes a really important part of the picture because e-commerce itself does not operate in a vacuum, right? We're going to have to address the, the larger set of challenges that our small businesses confront uh, in order to help them leverage the e-commerce opportunity. There is no question that we live in an age of technology now that is providing all of these new opportunities for e-commerce uh, that can really connect the local to the global. You know, we saw a restructuring of trade into global value chains. Now we're actually seeing a whole new world of, you know, value chains that are techno technologically enabled in the e-commerce sector. And we need to definitely help our small businesses leverage this opportunity, uh, availing markets, a broader set of markets, whether they're domestic, expanding from local to regional or international will also help businesses smooth, you know, smooth their operations. So when there's a shock in the domestic market, you still have access to a different market that can compensate. But in order to get there, in order to get from A to B, we have to also address this broader set of concerns that our MSMEs are confronting. And only when we address these can we help them leverage uh, the e-commerce opportunity. And, and as was just said uh, before uh, my comments, you know, the, the MSMEs need a whole lot of support uh, in order to be able to leverage this e-commerce opportunity. You know, um, in fact, I'd, I'd like to, um, uh, you know, uh, get Nirupma in here. Nirupma has worked uh, across major policies from, uh, oh, I don't find her here again. I think we've lost her again. Um, so, I mean, in the meanwhile, I'll, I'll go back to uh, Dr. Sharma. Nirupma, are you there? Can you hear me? Nirupma, are you there? You seem to be having some problems with uh, uh, her connectivity. Uh, no, we, we, she, she's still not able to get stable uh, in terms of a connection. But nevertheless, it doesn't matter. I go back to uh, uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, Dr. Sharma, you know, you've been part of this uh, uh, planning of Atmanirbhar Bharat, where we've, the Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, has been uh, talking about this Atmanirbhar Bharat. And he has several times spoken about his vision where, you know, there is a digital India, which is the enabler. And then on the other hand, you have um, uh, the infrastructure that has been put into place. And then thereafter, you have, uh, you know, the MSMEs and all the other, whether it's e-governance, whether it is uh, the uh, Department of Post, whether it is uh, Department of Health, every else, everybody else uh, coming on top of this layer. Now, e-commerce can contribute significantly in achieving this vision. Uh, uh, as uh, Sabina did talk about, it allows for products even from the internet to get into the national market uh, and not only national, but also international markets and can offer great amount of opportunities to artisans, small sellers from uh, tier two, tier three towns. Uh, one of the other panels that I was listening to on the other side was talking about how can we enable women which are not yet actually being able to, you know, come into the mainstream as far as entrepreneurship goes. But we've sort of experimented with a lot of women in the past couple of years, and they are very successfully working as far as e-commerce platforms go from just being the mom and pop store where they were living. So obviously, yes, there are also certain hurdles in building a robust e-commerce sector for crores of Indian MSMEs, which need to be removed also. So what do you think, uh, you know, having been a lawmaker on the other side of the table, uh, what are the hurdles that are pulling back India and what needs to be done? Uh, I will be very, very frank in saying so. It is very important to have just one arrangements as far as the e-commerce is concerned you know even though you may be governed by multiple laws that is by the it act or by the dipit department through its uh, like you heard about their press release in december 18 or the recent what you had of the consumer affairs department coming and then the rbi coming suddenly at some stage in the payment gateways 
they came up with papg that in the sense uh, if you give standing instructions on debit cards then every time you can't do that you will have punch the information in name of security so facing the opposition all these things in a standstill and then they, then there is a data privacy issues which keeps on cropping up and then instead of as a umbrella act it is coming in bits and pieces from different places so that needs to be harmonized that is very very important and that's a basic hurdle for the potential of expansion of e-commerce platform because uh, that is one platform we have to treat it as a platform we don't have to get into what, how much of investments they are doing into the back ends or what is happening which anyway you have restricted to 24% now if you are treating the e-commerce platform as a company where you talk of related party issues then you are making the whole thing complicated and what sabina rightly said it requires lot of hand holding of these msmes you will have to give them a feedback of what uh, uh, consumers have said what's going wrong in the product what betterment they can do in the product all these things can be done very effectively by these uh, e-commerce platforms once they get into this uh, whole business and they have a supply chain they can tell which product is selling which is not selling they can tell them about packaging they can tell them about the problems so a market feedback giving will help msmes to get the product beside just exploring the market and accessing those market and it is it is like a race you know if you don't enter the e-commerce platform then mentally be geared to be left out because that is how the consumer is shifting the consumer is not going to visit uh, a shop to do the selection it will first visit the e-commerce site to do the selection of the product it's only when they want to give a little walk to themselves or walk somewhere they will be walking there to the shop and getting it done now even your perishable goods are coming through the e-commerce platforms so all this is changing completely behavior so you have to harmonize these acts you have to make this e-commerce platform you have to treat them only as a platform and last but not the least point i will like to make that you will have to create a mapping and aggregation of the product from hinterland when you are getting it uh, aggregation of their produce aggregation of their raw material will help like if you take a china example they had trans village industry through guilds so trans village industry had a supply of raw material as well as finished goods and the expert monitoring what e-commerce platform is doing today the guilds are doing there we're doing now they are also shifting to e-commerce with alibaba and others uh, ruling the roost so these guilds were providing market feedback and a platform common platform by aggregating them uh, to ex- and spread across the globe to all the market so that role in india we expect from the e-commerce platform and that is where this kind of a hand holding this kind of an aggregation is going to go a long way so these three things is the top of the priority and has to be resolved at the earliest because the world is not going to wait the the vacuum will get filled up by any product coming from any corner of the world thank right? you thank you ma'am uh, in fact i'll go back to sabina sabina you know you Uh, having worked across various markets when you compare india with other countries using e-commerce as an enabler how do you feel you know uh, uh, arunam just talked about three very conscious things that need to be done what do you feel how should our policies be designed so that they are able to enable msmes and support them in addressing this op- huge opportunity which is in front of us today Yes, uh th- that's a really important question and I I think I think the first thing that we need to consider is the fact that India is is in many ways a very unique country. Our landscape of businesses, our landscape of workers, our landscape of regulations for a country as large as ours which is quickly on its way to becoming the world's most populous country doesn't necessarily <laughs> lend itself to comparison with you know countries that are more developed you know we we hear statistics all the time of the united states of various european countries and and I, and and so i i think that we have to be careful in terms of making those comparisons but as dr sharma rightly pointed out i mean if we are going to see the e-commerce uh, ecosystem thrive and and help our small businesses avail this new opportunity there needs to be very thoughtful consideration of having streamlined regulations 
you know, that, 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 and harmonized regulations that make it easy for businesses to avail this opportunity. Now, that is not to say that we, I mean, we, we need, that's not to say we need less regulation. That just means we need good regulation and streamlined regulation. Um, because Dr. Sharma also mentioned a really other important point, which is that not every business is equipped to avail the e-commerce opportunity, right? And some of those small businesses will be left behind, right? Not everybody is cut out to be an entrepreneur. And we'd like to think about, you know, uh, everybody has this opportunity, but it actually takes businesses are risky. Businesses take a lot of grit and hustle in order to, to you know, thrive and, and be successful. And so e-commerce is an opportunity, but for businesses to avail that, you have to be a business of a certain caliber. And, and if we want to expand the e-commerce opportunity to make it more inclusive, then we definitely need to be mindful of the streamlining of our regulations, um, and and um, you know, and then I think we'll be well placed to compare and compete with other countries. Um, two very, if if you'll allow me, I'll make two very quick points. Finald. One is you raised the issue of of women and e-commerce. And, you know, I think that's a really important point because we are definitely seeing a lot of women during the, especially during the lockdowns that created their own home businesses and were availing the e-commerce opportunity, selling their wares through different kinds of platforms, whether it's an Amazon and Etsy or, you know, even using social media platforms to market different kinds of products. I think that's fundamentally important, but that also, again, has to come with addressing a broader ecosystem of issues that plague female labor force participation, right? We have one of the lowest female labor force participation rates in the world. And, and unless we address the issues of time poverty, of patriarchy, you know, I don't want to make this discussion about everything. <laughs> but my point is that, that, you know, for a woman to actually be able to create a business, put it online and have it be successful takes a lot of time and energy, which women don't always get. So again, if we want to improve female labor force participation and help women avail the e-commerce opportunity, we need to address the broader set of factors that are holding women back, right? And and so, so I just want to really emphasize that point as well. Thank you. Excellent. You know, in fact, um, what you touched on, we've, we've sort of seen it uh, from quite some time. You know, um, um, our Minister for Women some time back did talk about the fact that India has seen 15 crore women you know, getting empowered as entrepreneurs through the mudra scheme. So that's these under the mudra, they've got some amount of money to start, you know, put in the first step. And that's precisely what we've been talking about. You know, then the handhold that you need actually to go from the first step to the next and so on and so forth is what is required. Otherwise, there's a huge pool of women that are, that are just uh, on the edge of, uh, you know, becoming entrepreneurs. And I'm, I'm very positive about the fact that a few women that we work with, um, in the last two years, and those we have enabled, we, we have close to 40% success rate with out of 700, 200 becoming extremely successful and then the remaining also not giving up. So it's a, you know, it, even though we might say it's a challenge for women and all that, but I find women extremely, uh, you know, I, I mean, capable and, you know, once they get their focus on something, they'll definitely do it. There's no two ways about it. So, so I, I and on that note, I have Nirupa back. So Nirupa, you know, one of the questions that we keep on talking about, you know, which is, you know, we also have the foreign trade policy, which is yet to see the light of the day. And um, we've been talking about that exports from India have been sort of uh, stable for very long. We've not grown that much. And on the other hand, you have B2C exports, which are primarily to e-commerce that have surged. You know, we just heard some time back that Amazon talked about a $4 billion dollar export from India through their uh, uh, B2C export, you know, the e-commerce front. So what are the further steps that need to be taken when we are talking about boosting exports, especially of those that are, that are you know, labor intensive exports from artisans from way back in the rural areas, people who are actually, you know, uh, uh, not able to get a lot of uh, uh, profit or money from whatever they are producing today. How, how can we enable them? And obviously, you know, boost our exports, uh, you know, through e-commerce. 
given that the pandemic is now at the almost at the edge, but we might still see a you know surge, a third wave, or whatever they call it. Sure. Thank you. I hope I'm audible this time around. Yes, yes you are. Thank you. Uh, so I, I think there are two very important things that we need to keep in mind when we speak of B two C exports. The first is, uh, notwithstanding the fact that our B two C exports have indeed surged, but if you were to actually compare that to how B two C exports work around the world, we're nowhere close to potential, and that's largely because of our logistics cost. Now, logistics is something that this country certainly needs to work on. Uh, the Point is, we are a very large country, and we have products, especially as you mentioned, from artisans and from handicrafts. Products that are being made in every nook and corner of the country that needs to be connected to the outside world. Now, before even you go outside. outside world and exports now the connectivity even within this country is very difficult if i wanted to order something sitting here in delhi um say from the corner of arunachal pradesh i know how difficult it is and it's practically impossible so logistics is certainly the first thing that we really need to work towards um most successful logistics um, uh you know countries with great logistics have leveraged their uh, post offices deutsche uh, you know your uh, your um, sorry dhl is one china certainly is the other so maybe we need to really uh, start thinking a little outside of the box in terms of how we use our indian postal system because they are connected even better than how your banking network is to be told as far as last mile connectivity um which also means that we need to start looking at logistics not in a centralized manner as far as the post office is concerned and decentralize some of the uh, functions so that each uh, post office in either the district or in a certain taluka or at, at, at its low you know at the at the closest last stand connectivity um, level is able to process things at a faster level so logistics certainly is one the second point that i'd like to make which is absolutely essential when you're looking at b2c exports especially through e-commerce is brand creation now india again in terms of traditional exports and what we've been good at we've always managed to do very well with white label goods whether it's been your arvin mills creating your denims and sending it abroad for it to be branded and sold back in india but brand creation has never been a strong suit which is probably why if you look at uh, a country like india with so many domestic brands none of them really have that kind of international um uh, uh, you know awareness as i would say or recall so brand creation becomes incredibly important not just for the big people but also for the smaller artisans etc we need to teach them how to create a brand because with e-commerce and b2c it is brand recall which is what creates that um, you know repeat buying so i think brand creation is the other thing that we need to really focus on so apart from teaching your um, msmes how to you know build capacity how to produce manage inventory i think an essential component of you know uh, education and this is true for your big and your small but particularly your msmes is how to create a brand what is branding and how do you kind of build upon that brand and leverage that brand thank you you know uh, uh, ma'am uh, uh, i i go back to uh, arna ma'am you know uh, you talked about the three issues on one hand you know we we all know that fact that you have uh, 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 dipp which sort of regulates e-commerce uh, and fdi in e-commerce then you have the meti which is responsible along with the ministry of communications for promoting the uh, internet uh, it e-commerce uh, then we have the it uh, uh, act which was promulgated in june 2020 which is an enabling statute uh, e-commerce has over the years Uh, i would say evolved in many ways and it's sort of changing the ways we 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 used to live or shop or do business so the entire retail i i, I think uh, industry of, on which nirupma has done a lot of work I mean, it, it is it is it is sort of completely got transformed and it encompasses today a wide variety of data systems tools uh, for online buyers similarly for sellers uh, similarly for shoppers also those that provide pay payment encryption and stuff like that and it is it seems like it's extremely important that we are able to put in a legal framework to support it to maximize the output and reduce the barriers so uh, what what all do you feel 
should be the next step that we should ask from the government that to put in place so we can enable more and more SMEs and people uh, from the hinterland map. Uh, absolutely right. Like what Nerupama was saying, was talking about the aggregation of the hinterland with a common brand. You know, like you do, you have to figure out on two, three developments which are happening in India at a different pace. So you have this KVIC or handicraft boards which aggregate these scattered products. So maybe they evolve with a common brand and then go to a place. So that is something. Then your payment system, digital payment system is also moving very fast and evolving. Uh, all smartphones are now enabled for the payment system. And uh, of course, there is a sandbox which is working on the feature phones, whether we can have a payment system there also. Now, with these kind of an aggregation coming into a platform, I think the first clarity in mind has to come in the minds of lawmakers and policy makers that e-commerce is just a platform. It is it is not not a trade trade. It's a conduit. You know, it is itself not manufacturing goods, nor it is a buyer. It is just a connect. So if by keeping that in mind, all the provisions where we are trying to control this e-commerce platform more on uh, you know uh, uh, the quality of the supply and uh, when we are talking about uh, their investments in the logistics arrangements because who will take the responsibility of logistic of these scattered things nobody is going to invest in uh, just warehouses if there is no conduit nobody is going to maintain the inventory if it does, there is a conduit so if you if i just figure out few immediate corrections that you have to do first of all you have to be very clear that it's just a platform and stick to that so that you you thrash out everything else which is irrelevant lying in these laws what you rightly mentioned the second most important thing which has to go along with it is that you have to allow e-commerce platform to invest into the logistics and inventory keeping because that only helps msmes especially to reduce their cost and increase their margins like the the study which was have been done has clearly shown that the margins have increased those msmes who put their product on the e-commerce platform so their margins are increasing so so that is very relevant you know like if more profit is going to an msme that makes the whole difference the share of the profit instead of through the distributor network and other network is now directly going to the manufacturer itself and that is what is important we have to understand you have to allow that investments and then maybe you know uh, this feedback mechanism and hand holding has to be encouraged it should be mandatory on the e-commerce platforms and e-commerce platform is not necessarily these big ones you know like what sabina rightly said many smaller things have come up now on the e-commerce platforms everything has come whether you are booking a taxi or whether you want a hotel room or you want to do something everything is now on an e-commerce platform so while you are operating in that zone you have to be less restrictive and more a facilitator so with that if you look at it with the hair comb there are many clauses in the proposed drafts will get seeded out there is no need for them at all and the difference is going to be it is going to pass the extra income into the hands of msb it is going to generate the employment which is a big challenge for india for its 1 million population and 65% youth uh, to whom we have to give them a good job like i said a sustainable level of employment and third most important is that in this process you will accelerate the gdp growth Yes. and if you start hampering this uh, new platforms which are coming then okay it's going to be time consuming for us to catch up with the gdp growth so so i think we have no option but to do this corrections so i, I have one more question for sabina and then we'll go on and uh, get uh, you know closing comments from everyone you know we we talk about uh, you know and I, you know especially at this platform i was looking at a lot of international uh, companies that are there and uh, people that are there somehow we back in india also feel that there is an in inadequate and inefficient i would say framework whether it's regulatory or legal for business in india and we don't able to cope well when it comes to uh, you know ensuring the rights and obligations of two business parties whether they could be contracting with each other or even just entering into business with each other there is also a need to support uh, the right 
regulatory culture when it comes to projecting this to the business world outside India. So what do you think in terms of uh, significant changes in our approach uh, to become get more investment, become a manufacturing destination and become a powerful exporter as far as the rest of the world is concerned? Thank you, Vinod, for that question. I, I think that's a really fundamental point that's not just relevant to this e-commerce discussion, but relevant, I think, more broadly to how India does business, right? Uh, we need to ensure that we have effective and transparent regulatory regimes, first and foremost, because when foreign companies, international companies are looking to invest and to engage, there is nothing worse than the opacity of law that leaves them in the dark, right? To the extent that we actually have very clear regulations that is actually conducive to business. And I think that that's a really important point to emphasize and it extends across. It extends to labor, it extends to taxation, it extends across the gamut to all the different kinds of, uh, you know, kinds of regulations, com co competition regulation and so on. Now, when it comes to, to e-commerce and, and platforms in particular, I think, you know, platforms are a new phenomenon and the speed and magnitude of their proliferation is happening much faster than the ability of regulations to keep up. And, and I think that that is, is, is really uh, problematic. So while I agree, I mean, India had 43,000 new startups in the last year. And, you know, and we want to create an environment that's induced, uh, conducive to these uh, startups uh, actually, you know, growing and, and becoming unicorns. But at the same time, we need to ensure that the regulatory regimes are clear and platforms because they're such a new phenomenon, we don't actually know how to regulate them, right? We need to place particular emphasis to ensure that we're, you know, we're sticking to proper competition regimes that don't disadvantage small businesses that are unable to avail the e-commerce opportunity like some other businesses are. Things like, uh, you know, as I said, competition, pricing, all of these become really important if we are to treat e-commerce platforms just as platforms and not as big businesses in their own right, then we actually need to regulate them in order for them to behave just like platforms and not behave like employers or, you know, uh, and, and follow the, the rules of competition uh, that are set broadly. So, you know, I, I, do, I don't envy Dr. Sharma's role and, and others that are involved in Pulse because it's not an easy balance to strike. Um, it's, a, it's a very difficult challenge, absolutely. So, yeah, so I'll just, I'll stop there. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. The excellent thank you. job that you, that you do. Oh, you know, you know, so what we talked about is, you know, we have this pandemic induced lockdown, uh, movement curbs for social distancing and so on and so forth. But this has pushed demand to record highs and deep into smaller towns and cities. Now that's the one thing. And on the other hand, we've also seen a sort of nudge for new buyers, uh, analyst sellers to get into digital platforms which have brought in a sort of a structural shift, I would say, in shopping behavior. Furthermore, you know, it's all, the COVID has also exposed the need to address questions about the extent to which small producers, sellers and consumers in India and economic, uh, economies like ours, which are in transition, can benefit from the opportunities that e-commerce provides. So one one sentence at the closing from all of you before we uh, move to questions. Right. So, so I'll just say that for e-commerce, you need a credible, consistent and convergent policies. With that, I think uh, we will move very fast and it's not difficult to do. So let us not keep on changing. Too frequent changes in policy also hampers the business climate and the expansion. So with these three mantras, I think the clarion call given by Prime Minister of Real Atmanarbar and encouraging the local productions and bringing them into more exports can become a reality instead of remaining at a low pace uh, performance. Sabina? I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think w what does the e-commerce journey for a small business look like? I think you need, we've talked about, you need market intelligence, 
you need market access, you need access to capital, you need logistics, which Nirupama emphasized, you need payment gateways and the ability to handle cross-border remittances. And we need all of this for small businesses to build a global brand. So, you know, so the regulatory frameworks have to speak to this end to end. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say that, it, that it's one thing to consider the B to C, but the other part of this equation is how, how, do, how does this changing landscape and emergence of platforms and e-commerce platforms actually affect workers and livelihoods on the other end of this spectrum. And that's a, maybe a, a different discussion, but an important one nonetheless. Thank you. Thank you. Hirupma? Uh, I, I think basically, at least in India, your lines between different formats of retail are blurring. And I think we need to take cognizance of that. So to that end, I think we really need to start thinking beyond regulating just e-commerce, whether as platform or whether as you know, as an inventory place model and look at regulating retail, because at the end of the day, the average consumer is agnostic to a platform is agnostic to origin of capital in that sense. So I think we need to have a retail policy which looks at all aspects. And in in, in that spirit, I also need to think that if you're looking at given the draft regulations that have been discussed quite a bit in India, and one of the points that's emerged is um, that you need to look at who are the kind of players who participate in retail, especially in MSME. And if, as, um, as, as, uh, as, as was mentioned at the end of the day, if you want more people to onboard these platforms and get on to a retail, you know, digitize themselves, then cost of compliance is something that we need to keep in mind because um, the smaller the entity, the larger the cost of compliance for them. So um, we also need to think from a regulatory point of view, differentiated regulations to ensure that the smallest of the small is not overburdened while the larger people are uh, subject to maybe higher compliance and higher regulation. So differentiated regulations for certain and uh, more than just an e-commerce policy, I've always advocated for a retail policy in India only because lines are blurring now and we need to hold all formats and all people up to the same standard. Excellent. Thank you very much, ladies. You know, I always say that, you know, when you're when you're talking to three ladies, you know, you you barely get to say anything, but they're all to the point and correct. So so I've had another day like that. You know, I, I feel personally the global shift towards online marketplaces has created an amazing opportunity for the MSME sector. And we can leverage e-commerce supply chains and actually lead the globalization of the make in India movement or products that we talked about. And with certain, uh, I would say, right regulatory and policy support, MSMEs can definitely surpass the 50% goal of you know the uh, achieving the five trillion economy very very easily. And I can see it happen. So thank you very much to all of you ladies for joining me today, and it's a, it's been a pleasure talking to all of you. you. You guys have a great weekend. I'm sorry we've taken away some part of your weekend time, but uh, hopefully we'll see you again very soon. Thank you Thank very you. much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Vinod. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.